Stand with me, would you please, for the reading of God's Word this morning, Luke chapter 16. Beginning in verse 19, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed from what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here and you are in ag anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Let us hear the word of God this morning. Our Father, we pray that this word uh, would sink deep into our hearts as we always pray. May Holy Spirit teach us the things we need to know uh, in order to live the life of holiness that you desire, not because we are earning merit with you, but because you've already given us the gift, free gift of eternal life. And so our desire is to live in a right way, with compassion for others, and with love for you. And so we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn to Luke 16, if you have not already. So we've been looking at this passage for a few weeks. We've seen that certainly uh, hell is a dominating subject here. And yet the passage is less about that than it is about the identity we choose because Jesus isn't just taking joy and talking about hell. What he's doing is trying to, I, to, trying to let us know there's a way to avoid this. And what identity you choose in this life will determine whether or not you spend eternity in this place of torment. Kind of with that in mind, in, against this passage, Tim Keller said this about hell as described in this text. He said, hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others. But you are still distinct from it. You may even wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you no longer can. Then there will be no you left to criticize the mood or even to enjoy it but just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. It is not a question of God sending us to hell. In each of us, there is something growing which will be hell, unless it is nipped in the bud. The people in hell are miserable. We see raging like unchecked flames in their pride, their paranoia, their self-pity, their uncertainty that everyone else is wrong, that everyone else is an idiot, all their humility is gone, and thus so is their sanity. They are utterly, finally locked in a prison of their own self-centeredness. They continue to go to pieces forever, blaming everyone but themselves. Hell is that writ large. Fascinating description of hell, isn't it? I think we concentrate so much on the flames and how that might feel physically that we forget what this is really about, the disintegration of the person. But that description that he's just written could be taken right out of our passage. As we've been looking at this passage, we said here's the outline we want to use. The eternal me is determined in this life. So I have a choice. I have a choice. We all have a choice. And that choice determines who I will be forever. Second point. Death reveals, but does not 
change me too late at that point. But I will be unveiled, the me that I have chosen. And this reveals three things about that. Number one, there will be surprises. Number two, there will be suffering. And number three, there will be splendor. There will be surprises. We looked at it a couple of weeks ago. Very important sermon. If you've not heard it, seen it, you know, get online and take a look at that one. I think it's so critical. There will be suffering. We started to look at last week. We looked at the first two points there. There will be torment without termination. So hell is a place where whether the flames are real or not isn't really the issue. The issue is that the torment of the disintegration of the person into just nothing left there but self and selfishness, which brings about nothing but anger and bitterness and hatred and all of that going on forever and ever, is hell. Secondly, there will be darkness without dawn. The darkness is what? Well, it's the absence of the light that is Jesus. The absence of the light that is God. God is light. First John 7, Jesus is the light. John 1, 9. There will be no Jesus there. There will be no God there. Mercy will be gone. All is despair, not a sliver of hope. It's darkness without dawn. So let's move on today to four more points here with regard to that. There will be regret without repentance. Regret without repentance. In verse 24, the rich man asks, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am anguish in this flame. Now we might well ask, well, does this, does this man regret how he treated Lazarus in this life? And I think there's a possibility that there's regret about the fact that as he sees the reversal of their situations now, completely going from one side to the other, that he might be a little bothered by that, that he might regret some of his actions. But whether he regrets how he treated Lazarus or not and his indifference toward Lazarus, I know one thing, he regrets where he is. He has great regret about that. He's in anguish. And he begs for relief. When that's not forthcoming, he says in verse 27, well, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of, re of, of torment. Regrets, yes, he's got a few. But then not too few to mention, right? He keeps talking about this. But repentance, no. There's no repentance here. Beloved, no one, who finds themselves in hell will be repentant. Anyone who is not repentant in this life will not be repentant in hell. And if you notice something interesting, notice in verse 24, rich man knows Lazarus. He knows him by name. Now up to this point in this parable, we might not have picked up on that, might have thought that he was oblivious to the beggar at his gate, but it turns out, no, he knew he was there. He even knew what his name was. So we can't kind of excuse him on the basis, well, he was just ignorant. He, 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 he didn't even know that the beggar was out there, and so we can kind of excuse him. We can't do that. He knew he was there. He knew his name. He's not just guilty out of ignorance. He knew and he did nothing. So with that in mind, you might think, well, surely he's ready to offer an apology then. Some kind of repentance might be going on. He would say to Abraham, I'm so far, or even to Lazarus, you know, I'm so sorry about the way, I, the way I treated Lazarus when he was sitting outside my gate and needed something and I didn't give it to him. I'm so sorry. If I just, you know, if I could just have a do-over, I would do it differently. But there's none of that. There's no repentance here. Despite his circumstances, somehow he has lost not one iota of his own self-importance, right? The universe, as far as he's concerned, still revolves around him. He's the center of everything. And in fact, he's perfectly comfortable to continue issuing, or issuing the orders. And his only thought about Lazarus is that he's a potential delivery boy. I need something. Send relief. Oh, by the way, that guy Lazarus, that would be good. Send him. 
But repentance, there is none. Nor will there ever be in hell. There's no God there to hear it. There's no Jesus there to forgive. And frankly, there's no inclination to seek repentance. A reporter once asked Claire Booth Luce, the senator, wife of Henry Luce, who owned Time and, and uh, Life magazine and all that kind of stuff. She became a senator and then an ambassador. Somebody asked her if she had any regrets in her life. She said, yes. She said, I should have been a better person, kinder. She said, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I remember a, girl had fr a girlhood friend of mine who had a brain tumor and called me three times to come and see her. I was always too busy. And when she died, I was profoundly ashamed. I still remember that after 56 years. That's a long time to regret an action, isn't it? But that's what hell will be, unending regret, but no repentance. And so you can, you know, you can picture, you can picture Pilate continually washing his hands as he walks through hell saying, I, I washed the, hand, the blood of Jesus off my hands. He regrets the action, but there's no repentance. You can see Judas throwing the money back and saying, I've betrayed innocent blood, but no Repentance, there will be regret without repentance. That's hell. Fourthly, in hell there will be rebellion without restraint. Rebellion without restraint. Notice verse 29. Rich man suggests that something more than scripture is needed to help his brothers avoid this horrible fate that he has found after he has died. But if you think about it, if you just think what's going on but behind the scenes with that statement, what he's really doing underneath this all is blaming God. Because if his brothers didn't have enough information, guess who else didn't have enough information? He's blaming God. His take on this is that God is at fault here. God didn't give me enough information. He's the whole reason that I'm here in the first place. It's all his fault. See, rebellion underlies that whole charade of requests. It's a, it's a backhanded slam at God for not giving him adequate information. If you have kids, you know how good they are at this kind of thing, right? Blaming anybody but themselves, somehow, some backhanded way. Ravi Zacharias, in one of his books, he wrote about a friend he had named Peter. He said, Peter heard a loud crash outside of his house one day. He ran outside to find out what was going on, and he found out that someone had violently crashed into a parked car. But apparently their car was good enough that they could move on. However, the radiator obviously had been broken because there was a trail of water. Uh, showing where the car went. So he ran down the street to see if he could find this. He turned a corner, and sure enough, there sat the car, steaming in the middle of the roadway with two very distraught-looking young men standing beside it. He ran up to them to find out what happened. Well, they had taken their, one of the, 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 the father of one of them, they'd taken his brand-new sports car without his knowledge and somehow run it into this parked car. Now they were feeling very, very nervous about what the uh, consequences might be. So Peter, who was a Christian, didn't know what else to do. He said, well, would you guys mind if I maybe I'll, I'll be glad to pray for you? <laughs> Without anything else to go on, they said, well, fine, yeah, can't hurt, can't hurt, right? Could you pray for us? So he prayed for them. And when he got done, one of the boys said, you know, if God really loves me, why did he let this happen to me? That's what hell's going to be like, beloved. It's going to be an eternal accusation against God. It's going to be the continuation of the rebellion that started here and now. If God really loves me, how come he didn't provide enough for me to know? He's the reason that I'm here. The rich man, here's the thing, the rich man didn't want to go to share God's heaven. He just wanted somebody to come and relieve him in his own hell. That's what he asked for. Because that's what hell is like. 
It's an eternal, why, if God loves me, did he let this happen to me? There's no personal responsibility. There's no sense of repentance, and there's no sense that I'm in anything except rebellion against a God who would possibly do this. Fifthly, we're almost done with hell. Aren't you glad I am? God put it here, though, beloved, for us, for a reason. There will be loneliness without let up. Did you ever hear this? I'm sure you have. I've heard it many times. Well, who cares if I go to hell? I'll be there with all my friends and we will party hardy. Right? I've heard that many times. Aaron Lewis has set the idea to music. Apparently doesn't think he has a chance to make heaven. He says, so let's have a party and tell him I'm home They'll be Waylon and Whitley as well, and the devil will be dealing the cards as they lay. So let's have a party in hell. Washed up, worn out, down on my knees, but the angels won't take me away. The bartender serves brown liquor in hell, and that sure sounds like heaven to me. So let's have a party and tell them I'm home. There'll be Janice and Jim Beam as well, and Rick James will bring all the cocaine you want. So let's have a party in hell hell. It's blasphemous. I must tell you, if that's your concept, if that's your hope, I can tell you this, you're going to be partying alone. You won't be partying with anyone else in hell. It's a place of loneliness, utter loneliness. Notice the rich man isn't asking for his brothers to join him there. Do you notice that? He doesn't want them to come there. This is not a place. This is a place of outer darkness. It's not a place. Hell is not party central. Some people want to depict it as. Such, a, such, a, such another thing that Satan has thrown into the minds of people that somehow they have this idea. It's a place of utter darkness and total loneliness. No friendship, no companionship. Just total desolation forever. We, uh, we were... A couple of weeks ago, we were up at, at uh, Mount Rushmore for a couple of days and with uh, Patty's brother and his wife, and we, and we went to one of the caves that's up there. Patty refused to go down. She usually does refuse to go down in those caves. But, you know, you get down there and you find out, I forget the name of the one we were in, but what was it called? Jewel Cave. Turns out there's literally hundreds of miles of cave underground there, right? It hasn't even... I think some very small percentage of it, less than 10% of it is, has been explored, although they are, there are amateur people exploring it all the time. But you get down there and you can, you can, be, you can be in a huge room, you know, um, way, way underground, and yet you can go off in these little directions, in all kinds of directions, and you're in immediate darkness. Imagine being on a tour through one of those caves, you know, and the guide has a light, some kind of light, and you're following along, and you're with the group, but somehow you get distracted, and, you, and, you, and, and, and they head off in one direction, you're not paying attention, you head off in another direction, and immediately you're in the blackness of night. You can't see your hand in front of your face. And yet there are options going in every direction. And you are utterly alone, cut off from any possibility of human contact. That's hell. It's not exactly a party atmosphere, is it? During World War II, one of the things the Japanese found out was, and, the, and they were experts at, at torture, as you may know, but they found out the best way to get someone to talk, put them into solitary confinement without absolutely no human contact, whatever. You know, food stuck under the door, no contact, no talking, no sense of any other individual around. Most people can't take that for very long. And they break. Bertrand Russell's atheism led him to say this. He, st he said, we stand on the shore of an ocean, crying to the night and the emptiness. Sometimes a voice out of the darkness answers, but it is the voice of one drowning, and in a moment the silence returned. He's, you know, he's, he's sensing even in this life what it's like to be without God and to be without human contact. It must be something... The actress, uh, Inger Stevens, some of you remember her from years ago, beautiful 
young actress was on, what was it, The Farmer's Daughter, I think, was the name of the show. And, and, uh, and just before she took her life, she, she was reported to have said this. She said, she said, sometimes I get so lonely I could scream. In this life, with people all around, what's it going to be like in hell? Loneliness without let up. Sixthly, there is God's glory, but without God's presence. There is God's glory, but without God's presence. Now this is, I think some people have a hard time grasping this, but it's true. The, Bi the Bible is a God-centered book. When you really study and get into it and figure it out, I mean, you know, we find out things about ourselves. We gain a lot of self-knowledge by the Bible. You hear people talking about, wow, I was reading the Bible and it was like it was reading my heart and it's true, that all happens. But the Bible is not about you and it's not about me and it's not about Abraham and it's not about Isaac. It's about God. That's what the Bible is about. It's his story. It's God-centered. And here's what the Bible teaches over and over and over again. It teaches that God will get glory eventually in everything. God will get glory in everything. And that includes the judgment of those who are cast into hell. We in our human limitations, I think it's impossible for us to grasp that. I think it's one of the things that we will finally grasp when we see Jesus face to face. I, I can't standing here this morning see how God will get glory in the suffering of anyone in this kind of place. But that's what the Bible teaches. God will get glory in everything. Peter says in 1 Peter 4.11, he says, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. In everything. God will be glorified by every person who by the grace of God is in heaven with him forever. He will also get glory from everyone who has rejected him and has thus earned their place away from his presence. Listen to a couple of verses. Revelation 14, verse 7 says, Fear the Lord and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Revelation 19, 1 and 2, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to God, for his judgments are true and just. Judgment and God's glory are not mutually exclusive. They end up in the same verses and in the same context in the scripture over and over and over again. God will get glory in those that he has chosen who will be with him in heaven forever and he will get glory equally from those who have rejected him and will be away from his presence forever because this is the way that he will rid the universe of sin and death and suffering and all the rest that goes along with it. You know, at the end of World War II, believe it or not, I was a little too young to remember this, but I know that we honored the generals, right? We honored General Eisenhower. We honored General Marshall. We honored General Patton. Why did we honor them? Because they had rid the world of the hideous plague of Hitler and Nazism, right? In a far greater way, God will be glorified for bringing an end to sin all time, even though it means the departure from his presence forever of some of his created beings. So hell will even be a place of God's glory. But, by, but beloved, while, while God's glory hangs over hell as a, as a forever reminder of his infinite holiness and his infinite perfections. God's presence as an active force will be absolutely gone, totally missing. As this passage says, there, there's the great chasm that has been fixed that is not passable by the presence of God. God is light, 1 John 1, 5 tells us. Hell is outer darkness. 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9 says, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. 
Some of you can relate to this little story better than others. I haven't had to do this, but I had to watch Patty go through it not too long ago. It's, 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 it's an account of a guy who went through an MRI. He had a herniated disc and they had to do this procedure. He found the procedure worse than the herniated disc. He writes this, he said, I was laid on a movable table and slid into a narrow tunnel where the door was shut on me. The confines were so small and the darkness so grim that I am convinced that whoever designed it was inspired by studying Egyptian sarcophagi. It was a terrifying experience, especially for one who is as claustrophobic as I am. And then he tells about how an attendant could speak to him through a speaker and would talk to him throughout the procedure. And he says this, he says, I want, I want you to know that even a total stranger's voice was immensely comforting in this closed box. But see, hell will have no such relief. There'll be no voice. There'll be no angels, there will be no God on the other end of one's prayer if one was inclined to prayer. But here's the thing that we have to remember that the Bible teaches. While in hell people will have only themselves for company, that will only be the end result of what they have chosen. They have chosen self in this life and hell will be the ultimate expression of self, and that's all that will be left. Just self, nothing else. I think we, we think of that in kind of good terms. You know, I like myself. You won't care much for yourself there when it's all you and nothing else. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says, in the long run, the answer to all of those who object to the doctrine of hell is itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out their past sins and at all costs to give them a fresh start? But he has done so on Calvary and they rejected it. Right? Are you asking God to forgive them? They rejected forgiveness. Are you asking God to leave them alone? Alas, I'm afraid that's what he does. He leaves them alone. That's hell. You could think of it this way. It's a self-imposed divorce from God. And if you're doing that in this life, that's what you will have for eternity. Lewis again says this. He says, there are two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. So that's hell. There will be suffering. The Bible presents it as real, presents it as tangible, presents it as the fate of all who will choose to reject a God who has given himself for them at infinite cost that we will never understand. But let's go to the next subject quickly, right? There will be splendor. There will be splendor. There will be heaven for those who have identified with Christ in this life, whose identity has centered around him, who have truly made him the Lord and Savior of their life. Hell is only half the story. Thankfully, for the person who's changed identities from self by giving themselves to Jesus Christ, like Lazarus, whose name means the one whom God has helped, there is great news. Splendor awaits them. Splendor awaits them. Splendor awaits those who will trust in Christ. Splendor awaits them who will come to the Father through the Son who has given his very life to pay the penalty for their sins. Splendor awaits them. No one can be too good not to need this. You can't get there on your own. But no one can be too bad to be disqualified from this great salvation. The salvation is so great. The splendor is so wonderful. That's why the Bible says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? It's a choice. But the splendor is absolutely 
amazing for those who will, without reservation, give their heart to Christ, find a new identity in Him, unimaginable splendor. We see, we, get, we catch a glimpse of it here in this passage. This passage is about primarily those who have rejected, but on the other side, we get a glimpse of the enormous difference. You know, the rich man is in torment. Lazarus is comforted. This passage tells us in verse 25. Didn't have any comfort in this life, but boy, is he going to be comforted in the life to come. The rich man is in outer darkness. But you know where Lazarus is? Turn to Revelation 21. Here's where Lazarus is. The rich man is in outer darkness. Revelation 21, next to the last chapter in the Bible. Revelation 21, verse 23. Lazarus is in a place that God describes this way. He says, the city there has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. It's way better than sunlight. It never ends. It is without diminishment of any kind. The light of the glory of God will be the fate of those who have trusted in Christ as Savior, as opposed to the outer darkness of those who reject Him. The rich man has regrets after regret after regret after regret. Lazarus, look at verses 4 and 5 of Revelation 21. Just back up. It says, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. No regrets there. None at all. The rich man rebels against God. He's in continual rebellion against God. He's blaming God eternally. Lazarus. For Lazarus, the rebellion was over the moment he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ so that his name could be called the one whom God helps. And here's what he's experiencing now, Revelation 21, verse 3. Back up a little bit again. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. For the rich man, it's an eternity of intense loneliness with only himself for company. For Lazarus, he's already arrived in the presence of God. What could ever be better than that? In addition to that, we find him lying in, the, in Abraham's bosom. What's that? That's a depiction of the first century, uh, the first century uh, habit of when, when they came to a, to a feast, they would lie on their side instead of sitting up like we do, just like John was at the Last Supper with Jesus lying on his breast. Remember that? That's what Lazarus is doing here with Abraham. He has the company of the greatest, but the greatest of all is he's in the company of God. Heavenly is a is a perpetual feast, love feast, and feast of fellowship for those who love God, with those who love God, and with God himself. The splendor of the glory of the presence of God. It's impossible to describe the splendor of heaven. There's a TV show a few years ago that was documenting, a nature show, you know, documenting that there are a, a thousand species, this may be news to some of you, it was to me when I saw it, but a thousand species of self-illuminating fish that live at the bottom of the ocean where it's so dark you can't see, right? Thousand species of them. One of them, one kind of them, they have a little, it's, it's like a little lantern dangling from their chin so that food is enticed into their mouth. All they gotta do is open their mouth and here it comes. Bottom of the ocean. Some other ones have their chin is, is, is illuminated in a similar way and the food is enticed to them. So others have little beams of light coming right out of their, b beneath their eyes. And you ask yourself, you know, how, how, can, that, how, how, can, you have, how can you have this at the bottom of the, of the ocean? Where do they plug these things in at, right? How do they run these without batteries? How does that work? And why did God make a thousand of them? Why didn't he just make one? Wouldn't that have been enough to prove the point? Why just one? I'll tell you why. Because God is lavish in his beauty. He's lavish in his love. He's lavish in everything that he does lavish in his splendor. If that's what's going on at the bottom of the ocean, what do you think heaven's going to be like? You can't even begin to imagine. There 
is splendor in heaven beyond description. Don't you want to go there? You can. But only if in this life you give up your identity as self and you take on the identity of Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you take on the identity Paul had when he said, for me to live is Christ. Is that true of you? That's what it means to identify with Christ. Christ is the only hope of glory, but he's also the certain hope of glory. It's our choice. Suffering of hell or the splendor of heaven. I, I've used this illustration before, but I think it's so appropriate to close this series. We've got to, next week we'll look at the last verses of this chapter because they're very important, but we're kind of at least out of heaven and hell by that time. Um, Calvin Coolidge was, before he was president, was governor of Massachusetts. And on one occasion, there, were, there was some wrangling going on among the legislatures in the Massachusetts state legislature, and it got pretty heated. And eventually, one of the legislatures, leg legislators told another one, just go to hell. Now, I know you don't think politicians ever talk that way. That would never come out of their mouth, but one of them said that. And so the one who was told that came, you know, he came to Coolidge and he described the dispute that was going on. And he said, on top of all the rest of it, this guy personally antagonized me by saying, go to hell. And Coolidge said, Senator, I've looked up the law. You don't have to go. <laughs> you don't have to. It's your choice. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word we will never be able to say that you have not warned us, that you have not in your grace described to us what's coming. We'll never be able to say that you didn't make provision. We'll never be able to look at you and say, you don't know what it's like. You know everything about what it's like. In fact, you've lived the life we could not live. You've suffered not only the temptations that we suffer, but you've You've suffered worse because you never gave in to a single one as you came and lived as a man. And then you died to pay the penalty for our sins. We'll never be able to say, you don't understand. You didn't make provision. If God loves me, how could he let this happen? It's our choice if it happens. May it never be true of anyone sitting here this morning. And may it never be true, Father, of our friends and loved ones and those that we love. Help us to be faithful no matter what mockery we may face, no matter, if, uh, Father, if we lose friends. What's the point if, they, if, if we never speak to them and they go to this place because we never warned them? And so I pray, touch our hearts, and give us your perspective, and then help us to live it. Lord, anyone who's not sure here today, would you please give them the courage to come and ask, how can I be sure that I'm going to heaven? I'm not sure. I just don't have the assurance that I really belong to Christ. Can I have that? Yes, you can. Help them to open their heart right now. I acknowledge myself to be a sinner before God. I try hard, but the harder I try, sometimes the further I go down. At the very least, my thought life is abominable. Oh God, please help us to see ourselves as you see us, but then also to see ourselves in Christ. Help us to acknowledge you. Help us to turn our lives to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.